As you can see, Mr. Prellis is sitting down, and uh, that means that we are about to start uh, the panel part of our, uh, of our hour-long session. I would like to welcome the rest of the panel uh, onto the stage. We have uh, uh, Mr. Kjell Magnebonovic, who you heard before. And we have Mr. Rune Bjerke from uh, the DNB Bank. We have Marianne Barner from the IKEA Group. And we have uh, Navjot Sandu, who is uh, a mentor with uh, the Global Dignity Day here in Norway. Welcome to you all. Um, this session is about values. So we've, we've been talking about empathy, we've been talking about dignity, uh, and uh, words that can mean many things that might not be so concrete unless you start talking about concrete uh, issues. Uh, Navjot, we're going we're to start with you and uh, we're going to see a, a small film uh, about the project that you're involved with. Yes. If we can roll that, please. We should help each other. No one knows everything. Some people not, don't know dignity. Everybody was created equal. You should respect your faith, he, whether he's small or he's big. <laughs> International dignitaries, Norwegian royalty and young global leaders from the World Economic Forum descended on a small school in Grassy Park just outside Cape Town. All this in aid of the Dignity Day. I'm going to have some of you come up here and tell your dignity story. My story started out for me with my story. I was a clown who needed attention. Everybody laughed at me. Everybody said I was going to fail. Everybody said it would never work. So, everything you all are going to Everybody in here can change the world. You, 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 you. are all very talented people. The question is that how will you use your full potential in ways that increase also the dignity of others? It does not only transform the life of the students participating in a Dignity Day. It also transforms the life of those doing Dignity Day. The honesty that your messages have come across with, I just I don't thank you. Are you going to leave? No! I love you too. Yeah! Don't let anybody tell you what you cannot do. We can't always change the outcome, but we can change the experience. Come and go some way to see that after that you have done this, it's a really fantastic experience. You are made today to difference in the world. It's important to be inspired. Yes, indeed it is. Now, it, how do you translate that big word, dignity, into something that people in the classroom can actually use? Well, the, uh, the thing was that I didn't translate it for them. They translated it themselves. So uh, it's a very heavy word. But I think for youths, uh, even though they don't use this word in their daily life, they can uh, relate to it. Uh, so some of them define it as a status, as respect, as honor, as a cultural, f uh, cultural family, friends, uh, rights, and um, as you see, as you saw in the movie, uh, everyone did not only relate to it, but uh, when we, I mean, we actually saw a change during the whole day because when we started. Uh, people were just sitting next to each other, but after the session ended, people actually saw each other. And um, some might say, can Dignity Day actually make a change? Well, for me, I didn't believe it could, but still I participated. But after being through a lot of schools, I mean, we salute Malale for having this uh, strength, you know, this energy. But after being to all these different Norwegian uh, schools, I saw, I saw the spirit and the strength of Malale in every uh, corner in the schools. And they had the strength already, but what Global Dignity Day did was actually to bring that in, in a, I mean, out to the light and uh, by sharing their stories. So everyone sort of felt that day that they can actually make a change. Well, we heard David earlier talk about, uh, um, he said, it doesn't matter what you produce, uh, uh, you can make, or it doesn't matter what you can make if you don't have uh, integrity, if you're not being seen. Do, do you agree with that? Of course, uh, 
part of actually, um, I mean, feeling uh, the word dignity is also to be acknowledged. And as a, as a young person, one of, I mean, I think uh, uh, the key assets is actually that someone sees you and someone respects you and th that you're actually taken serious. And uh, I think uh, for a lot of the teenagers who came up to the stage and spoke to our audience, uh, maybe for the first time, for them it was uh, a whole new experience. It was like this young guy, his name was Umar, and he said, you know what? I want to shine like a diamond, but I just don't know if I have the right color. <laughs> and uh, being able to get on the stage and to shine like a diamond, even it didn't matter what kind of color you had, people were actually seeing you, people were actually taking you serious. And that experience for youngsters can actually be uh, a change maker. Do you believe that in, in our Norwegian society, uh, you're also part of uh, the, the think tank uh, Minotank yeah. uh, for, for minority groups in, in Norway. Uh, we're quite new at this in Norway to, with the integration and, and trying to include and trying to, to, uh, to establish respect for, for all members of society. Um, how, how important is it for, for young uh, Norwegians of immigrant background to, to get that understanding very early on that they, that they have respect, that they are being seen? I think it doesn't matter what kind of background you have. As a person, as a human being, everyone wants to be understood. And especially um, when you are brought up by parents who never had that feeling that someone understood them. Because they moved away from uh, their safe environments, their family, their friends, something that they could relate to, to something new. And that is a huge change. And when you're brought up by parents who have those kind of feelings, I think it's actually extra important, especially uh, for the youths who have minority backgrounds, to feel that, you know what, we actually belong somewhere. And people often say that, you know, I have roots from this part of the world, I have roots from that part of the world. When you talk to youngsters, they actually have wheels. You know, they are global citizens. And for them, it's just not only about uh, being accepted and feeling a part of a society, but it's also more about uh, finding common values. So as long as they find com common values, for them, it doesn't matter where you come from, what kind of skin color you have, what language you speak, what you eat, ate for dinner. And um, uh, being a minority is not easy. I mean, one thing is how the individual uh, sort of ref reflects on himself, but the other thing is the perception the society has. I mean, if you look at youths as brands, I mean, will Umar sell the same way as Ula? I mean, this is just a question. I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> and that's something we should reflect on. Um, I mean, of course, we, we are um, a multicultural society. But is it, is it, is it um, I mean, we're talking about equal rights, but is this just something we are talking about or are we actually, are we actually practicing them? <laughs> That's food for thought. Um, we'll get back to you uh, to late, uh, a bit later. Um, I want to move on so we can introduce the whole panel. We have Marianne Barno, you're from the IKEA group. You, you've been there for uh, 20 years now. And you've been heavily involved with uh, fighting child labor. Um, and at the same time, you're also talking about legal rights for young workers under the age of 18. Uh, how does that paradox work out? Uh, first of all, I, I think th this, this theme with the young people is so important. I, and I go back to um, what uh, the Crown Princess said about uh, so many young people are unemployed. And I think that... Um, Global companies, IKEA and many other companies, we have, we have enormous opportunities to, to, um, to, to give young people a good start. And um, uh, we have uh, initiatives in, in our retail countries, but also then thinking in emerging economies and developing countries where we have business and really there is one sentence that we have set as the guiding sentence for everything we do when it comes to children, and that is that all actions shall be in the best interest of the child. All actions shall be in the best interest of the child. 
that puts a lot of responsibility uh, on our shoulders. And it, it means also that we must gain knowledge about the, the communities where we are involved and so. And um, we, have, uh, we have been working uh, with our suppliers, sub-suppliers, for uh, very actively now for 13 years to improve working conditions, both socially and environmentally and so. And we also have a um, very strong uh, child labor, the IKEA way on preventing child labor. In that code, we also say very explicitly, which is in the best interest of the child, we support the legal employment of young workers. And why is that so important? Well, it is so important that young people 14 to 18, 15 to 18, or 16 to 18, depending on, 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 the, um, on the regulations, on laws, and opportunities for children, that they really gain access to good working uh, opportunities. And that's why uh, th there, there is no paradox in it. It's, it. It is to act in the best interests of the child, to really give young people opportunities to learn, and to grow and uh, get an education. So when you employ young people at uh, IKEA, what kind of values do you install in them uh, to, to, uh, to retain them as, as good, uh, happy workers and human beings? IKEA is a very values-driven company, which uh, I, it is, and, 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 to, and to have a vision to create a better everyday life for the many people, uh, that that is uh, that is a fantastic fantastic vision that that guides us, uh, uh, and young people, um, young families and children, they are, I don't know, have you been to IKEA? Any of you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, then you know that uh, I, I I feel very proud on how we welcome children in our stores, <laughs> and uh, that they are uh, they can. Uh, jump around, they can get this rest from their parents uh, for an hour and so. And um, it's also about, I mean, that young people are welcome to work at IKEA. And um, they can, we, when we employ people, we employ very much on values and not so much, you can, you can learn to work, and you can learn so much within the company. So it's, it's about values, and, your, and you, we give opportunities if it's in our retail countries, in our stores, it can be in lo the logistics, it's about, uh, we don't have so many factories, uh, our own, but there are. And that they can grow personally and professionally. And more and more, I see that our countries uh, they work together with schools, they work together with authorities to help young people to come uh, to, to, to start uh, a traineeship. It can be for three years. And uh, many of these young people then grow into leaders. And what we have set as a very, very, we want to be a humanistic, modern workplace. And we really want our leaders to be business and people orientated. So that is what we we welcome the young people to go into this, to go on to this uh, journey to, um, yeah, create this better everyday life for the many people by offering uh, furniture so that as many people as possible can, 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 can afford it. Uh, and we have, that is a long tradition at IKEA. But I can see that we, we put more and more emphasis on it today. And that is that young people pretty soon uh, get um, responsibility at IKEA. And you know how it is. You grow when you get responsibility. You make mistakes. Yes, you make mistakes. Don't make them too often the same mistakes. But all of us grow by making mistakes. And that is something that our founder has put so much into our, ourselves. Make mistakes, then we grow. 
but correct yourself and, uh, and, and we grow together and we are on a journey together. So, so young people are, are very important uh, at IKEA, both as customers, as co-workers, and, um, and th th then, then I, I, I think I myself, I have learned so much with um, this work this social work or the, the work outside IKEA in a way to prevent child labor using this very holistic approach together with UNICEF, Save the Children and also UNDP and where we have seen how much we as a company also can do beyond our, uh, our normal uh, business. And that has also given us this knowledge and insight into the importance of, of how that young people can get a job when they uh, finish uh, school, and they finish school very often earlier than in, uh, in our world. Thank you very much. Uh, making mistakes, um, if you have a young employer and he makes a mistake, that might cost you uh, millions of kroner. Uh, how, how do you, are they allowed to make mistakes at DNB? Uh, if you make a mistake, you should try to do the same mistake the second time. So, I mean, you should learn that could be by making the ex <laughs> uh, mistake, but at, at the same time, you should also develop yourself. So, both you and the rest of the organization avoid to, uh, to do the same mistake. But you are not punished if you make one mistake in DNB. Well, that's, that's, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, now, you're a massive company. You're the biggest uh, financial service provider in Norway, um, and that gives you a tremendous responsibility also for, for the young in, in Norway. Uh, how do you balance that responsibility with uh, the need to secure customers at a young age? I mean, young customers behave different, and that's the exciting thing with the new banking reality, because we need to develop the way we actually act as a bank. Young people uh, don't visit branches. They don't send letters to the, to the bank to complain. Uh, they actually meet us on Facebook, on social, different other social medias. They are eager to take part in business development, and we, we, we invite them in. We have organized the DNB Lab, where we actually have taken out business development from the organization of the bank. And invite the customers to do the business development on behalf of the bank and we communicate and through uh, the clients, the young clients ideas and proposals we are able to develop ourselves and that of course gives the clients um, uh, a strong and good feeling when they see that their ideas actually uh, are realized. So that's one way of doing it but of course we need to, to train young people as well. So, uh, I mean, personal finances, of course, is one of the most important things. And we try to invite 15-year-old uh, uh, pupils into our offices and to train them. We also support different projects. We support uh, projects uh, through the Red Cross, through Purple Project, and other things where we actually meet the young people and try to learn them how to position themselves in a good way for the future so that they actually can get a mortgage when they need it. So what are the core values you're looking for then? I mean, we are, uh, we are looking for uh, different values. The most important value is to, to take control of your own life. Get a job, get control over your personal economy, position yourself for the future, and take part in the development of what's happening in the financial community. So, uh, a lot of opportunities are um, uh, offered, and I can guarantee you, uh, young people are eager to participate. We received more than 30,000 proposals for how the bank should develop in one day. And many of those proposals are actually being followed up. What was the best idea? <laughs> I mean, uh, one of the best ideas was to create a special unit for young Morgan mortgage applicants. And we have, actually, uh, we have actually established one such unit inside the bank, only working with young people uh, 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 applying for mortgages. Thank you. Um, Kjell Magne Bonnevik. Um, 
just like David Senge, uh, I also attended United World College uh, when I was uh, younger um, in, uh, in Singapore. And I, li I lived in a house with uh, lots of young people uh, from many different countries, uh, and all we talked about were, were values uh, and how to create a better world and uh, being the leaders of tomorrow and all of this. Now, you have had the chance to, to stay uh, with your idealism and to use it uh, as a politician and now uh, in your organization. How, how do you retain that wish to do uh, or to make the world a better place and to, to de develop uh, values in young people and to do the work uh, that your organization is doing? How do you grow older without becoming cynical? Pardon? How do you grow older without becoming cynical? <laughs> Well, I'm still inspired to go on. And I think there are two main reasons for that. Uh, first of all, I have some basic values, which really inspire me every day to go on. And secondly, we should not forget that the world is moving smoothly in the right direction. And that inspires me as well. It's less poverty today, extreme poverty, than it was 20 years ago. It's more democracies today than it was 20 years ago. It's less abuse of human rights than it was 20 years ago. Uh, all the figures, the main figures, are going in the right direction. And that is an inspiration for me, and I want to contribute a little bit to push it even further. And I think it's so important to engage young people in this regard, because we see in many countries, as the country I came from yesterday, Pakistan, that extremism is, uh, is a huge problem, uh, even terror. What is the main reason for extremism? Why are so many young people become extremists instead of being positive engaged? I remember from my time as prime minister, we had a conference together with, uh, with uh, Elie Wiesel, uh, a philosopher and Nobel laureate. And we came to uh, about the root causes of terrorism. And we came to the conclusion that a main cause of extremism and even terror is the feeling of humiliation. If you feel humiliated, you become desperate, extreme, and can even be a terrorist. So therefore, it's so, and humiliation can come out of different reasons. For instance, many years occupation is a reason for humiliation. But feeling excluded, exclusiveness, is another main reason for humiliation. And I'm afraid that if the younger generations are feeling excluded from the political processes, some of them, instead of being positively engaged, will be negatively engaged and can be, uh, can be extremists. That's what we are seeing now. So therefore, it's so important that we create platforms for positive engagement, and that's what we are trying to contribute to in, in some countries. Let's take South Sudan, the youngest nation of the world. If that country should be run only by elderly men, like me, and even older, that's dangerous. So that's why we try to involve young people in a forum with youth from all the 10 states in the country. So their voice can be heard into the political process, and especially in these days into, into the constitutional process. They are going on to adopt a new constitution in some months. And I'm inspired when we, uh, when we can contribute uh, to such engagement. Just to pick up uh, on, I think it's interesting what you said about humiliation. And, and Saji, you, you come from a place, as you were talking about, that's been ravaged by war for, for three decades. And uh, the war ended four years ago, uh, almost to the day. Uh, and there were a lot of humiliated people left in Sri Lanka, and there, there's a lot of anger still left. Do you believe that the younger generation in Sri Lanka have uh, values or other values that might help them avoid the problems of their, of their parents and grandparents? Let me address it this way. I mean, the notion of values, I think, cannot, has to be, when you talk about values, the word dignity you use, I would also add the sense of identity. Understanding the sense of dignity, it's about respecting them, empowering them, but also really helping them feel like their, their self is worth something. That people actually listen to them. You were talking about this also. But I think listening cannot be about just us listening to them. 
and giving them opportunities. We as adults need to also change. Otherwise, we'll continue to create these open cycles of not connecting the dots. I, I, in, in Sri Lanka, a lot of young people, for the majority population as well as the minority population, are more in the middle of, middle of the road, not taking the extreme views for the government or against the government, for the LTT or against the LTT. There's a majority of people, that, even in Pakistan, or even in Sierra Leone, Liberia, other places, we always tend to focus on, uh, in, in, when you look at the numbers, it's only a few people who are creating a lot of trouble. The majority of young people are not committing acts of violence. If you really look at the numbers, it's only a small number of people. So if we focus all our effort on this small number of people who are committing acts of violence, what are we sending a message to the world? The message we are sending is that you can continue to do this because you're gonna get a lot of glory, you're gonna be on television, a lot of people are gonna talk about you. So you're promoting their own bad message. Whereas a lot of other young people who choose not to carry a gun, but choose a pen or a pencil, or now an iPad or a smartphone, we are not, we need to be sending a better message. You said earlier that uh, the young need to be included at the table. Uh, but do we need a, a, a bigger table or do we need a better seating arrangement? I think we should engage young people in designing, young men and young women and adults, young older men and older women, together in shaping the table, not just having a table and having them come to the table. They should be all part of shaping the design, the shape of the table. Otherwise, what will happen is there'll be young people who end up being on the plate. If you're not on the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> and let me, if, if I just do the intervene for a second here, because it's a mistake when we always only talk about the young people as the future. Of course, they represent the future, but the young people, they are also a part of today's society. They have the right to influence on the politics of today, not only the future. That's so important to remember. We're, we're running out of time. I just want to end up with, uh, take, take you up on that point. Uh, are there, uh, and with you, I, I want to ask you, Naviat, what uh, Bonovic is saying here, including the young people. Now, you're doing that by, by going to classrooms and, and engaging them and making them become inspired. But how do you think you can, or one can bridge that gap and, and actually make young people into decision makers? Well, they are already decision makers. And uh, I will say, of course, I, I mean, we try to inspire them, but uh, I think uh, by the end of the day, they're actually inspiring us. And it's about, um, I think we, as the majority of the society, uh, we should stop pretending <laughs> to understand their language, you know? Because I think that that's the main mistake here. If you want someone to engage, start pretending and just listen to them. You be yourself and, as an individual and let them be the youths. And of course, uh, they're, they're, they are part of this time, but they're also part of the future. And they are the key holders. So we need to uh, acknowledge uh, their power as well. So I think uh, by respecting them and seeing them and stop pretending that we understand how it is to be a youngster now. Because, I mean, I was 15, 15 years ago, so that means I'm 30 now, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I still remember how difficult it was, you know? It, it was hard, but being a 15-year-old now is even more difficult because you are out there. You are out there through Facebook, you're out there through Twitter. Everyone can have um, a comment about you. Everyone can have a meaning about you. You are out there. And I mean, from being a nobody to actually being a celebrity on your own Facebook is actually a huge responsibility and also a burden. Hmm. Yeah, I was hoping that we could talk about technology and how that, uh, how, how that can bring about positive change and bring about uh, uh, values. That will have to be uh, at another session. Uh, it's 12 o'clock, that means it's uh, lunchtime. Uh, I just want to end up with a quote I think everyone knows from a, a very old man, and he was very wise, uh, Louis Armstrong, when he said that, uh, I hear babies cry, I watch them grow, they'll learn much more than we'll ever know. Thank you very much to our distinguished panel and uh, have a good lunch. <laughs>